So I'm Vladka, um, um, and I'm out of voice at the moment. <laughs> So I'm, I will be speaking about health without uh, my personal health. Um, if you have problems hearing me, you have to shout out because uh, obviously I cannot know. Uh, I will keep very close to microphone and afterwards I would like Dries to um, disinfect this microphone. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Um, as you know, like WHO, World Health Organization, is... Uh, saying alarming things that air pollution is driving global health crises, that it has certain numbers of millions deaths in a worldwide, that um, most of the population living in a in a planet are um, exposed to unsafe limits for the uh, of air pollution. Um, and what's, of course, interesting is that air pollution is a mi mixture of gases, like SO2 and uh, NOxs, and particles, which then later on is very important for, for health. Because, for example, particles on those, we can have um, some uh, heavy metals that are then influencing health, or uh, gases can with uh, make secondary particles and so on. So th the complexity of air pollution is, is important, but uh, uh, and it's kind of difficult as well for health to then make a links. So uh, what are particles? So the particles are small um, compounds, let's say. With, uh, we separate them by um, by mass or by size, and in this graph we see uh, the concentration in total of particles. How much of those are PM10? So you see that in the right side that it's quite low, and the most of the particles are actually low, uh, smaller than PM2.5 or or uh, finer or ultra fine uh, particles, which then means something else for health, and this is that they can go very deep into lungs. So here we are. Um, <coughs> so this this graph shows um, the position fraction uh, per particle diameter. So as you see in a like upper uh, upper. Uh, a respiratory tract you can you can have mostly like bigger particles like pm10 then as you go lower and lower uh, smaller particles of pm2.5 or lower ultrafine particles are deposited and then of course uh, this means something for um, how how long it it will stay in your um, in your body basically so for uh, deposition in alveoli, so these are the uh, small tissue in the lungs that are making the transfer of oxygens. Um, sm the smallest particles are deposited and then of course the clearance can last for years afterwards. <laughs> Biological mechanism. So two main things are that um, uh, why particles are important. These are for ultrafine particles, but the same goes for uh, lo um, larger particles, uh, is that it affects cellular level, which means cells, and it affects as well circulation. So in terms of a cellular level, or uh, aff if, um, effects on a cell, it can uh, do... Um, uh, oxidative stress, which basically means um, damages to a cell, or it can do inflammation. And then, of course, this means later on that um, there will be certain dysfunction in, um, in vasoconstriction, or um, so your blood vessels will constrict and dilatate less uh, flexible, which then means, of course, that, that you will have problems with adapting to uh, either low temperatures or high temperatures, and uh, the the um, and 
there will be more chances that you will develop than, for example, stroke uh, through this and so on. Um, and another influence of, those, of, of this uh, oxidative stress and inflammation is our on blood coag coagulability, which then uh, makes it makes a link with this um, vasoconstrictions or dilatation. Basically, your blood is coagulated more and your vessels are not as flexible, so which is like a double uh, problem. Um, <coughs> so this is on a cellular level and then on a circulation level is basically that uh, particles are deposited into lungs and then as same as oxygen is uh, going uh, via um, uh, red blood cells, same particles can do. So they can be transferred to blood and then via blood they can go into heart, into brain, into um, liver, bone marrow, and so on. So uh, there will be two ways or two mechanisms how this will affect your health. Um, this lovely graph or uh, table shows uh, basically I wanted to express like what are the WHO limits or World Health Organization and what are EU li uh, limit values. So for example for SO2 you see how much uh, uh, higher EU limits are or for example particulate matter um, it's two and a half fold for PM 2.5 or uh, um, two fold for uh, uh, for ten PM ten, <coughs> um, which brings another question. For NO two, basically WHO limits are the same as the EU levels limit levels, and those are basically somehow saying that this limit of forty micrograms per uh, meter cube are is it a value that will avoid most severe ex exposure problems? While for the PM 2.5 and PM 2.10 concentration, there is a discrepancy in between the limit values. So for example, WHO is saying, okay, after uh, we have certain amount of evidence that will show that after uh, 10 micrograms per cubic meter, there will be severe or more severe um, exposure and more severe health effects. That's why we cut off at this point, while US has a um, different cut-off point and um, EU is quite behind, so 25 micrograms per uh, meter square. Um, Okay, this is a number of studies uh, showing nonlinear um, uh, correlation with uh, how much you are exposed to different to PM 2.5 concentrations of 2.5. Basically, what I wanted to say with these two graphs is that, that for example, in Luvdat, and you have a cutoff point, or saying the good air quality is uh, of PM 2.5 is something around. 20 or 40, which is totally meaningless. It's basically, uh, this is totally my opinion, um, saying the, the the values are based on what? On um, on policy that currently exists, that is currently under process of review, and that is politically um, agreed. So it's not even like scientifically proven. It doesn't, or like there is basically something we have to check also, okay, we, we are saying the air quality is good or not, but what this means, like under which um, um, what is then good? And we have to define this, whether is it for health or is it just some scale that we developed and we agreed, okay, this will be a good or not. Um, <clears throat> so this is maybe a point to take home and then think about later on when we uh, want to think, okay, these measurements that we are doing, for what? For environment, for health, for climate, 
like, and then we can develop a scale or, or at least have a rationale why we are using this scale. <coughs> In terms of um, exact numbers, um, like affecting health, so I pre prepared this uh, graphic on um, increased risk for health impacts. Um, and there is a difference between long-term exposure and short-term exposure. And uh, via different kind of meta-analysis, um, scientific uh, agreement at the current level is that uh, like um, every, every increase of 10 micrograms uh, of PM2.5 or 20 p uh, micrograms of PM2.10, uh, PM10, um, will e increase, for example, mortality by 6.2 on a population level. So this might not seem much, 6.2, but if you take whole of Belgium and calculate that this, or how many Belgians are exposed to um, higher uh, concentrations than 10 micrograms per meter square, a meter cube, then you will get a pretty high number. <coughs> And the same goes as well for the arrest, like infant, infant mortality, for prevalence of bronchitis, for asthma attacks, for um, hospital admin, um, admissions, and so on. And now one super nice slide, because I heard that most of you are programmers, and you like numbers, and you like as well a lot of text may be in a code, but I thought, okay, you might like this slide. <laughs> um, so this is something that uh, WHO developed. Uh, basically, it's um, showing a summary of all the evidence and then meta-analyzed uh, together, forming ca um, ca uh, parameters were taken in, so like mortality, different kind of mortalities, infant mortality, mortality or adult mortality, then different kind of hospitalization for respiratory disease, then you have cardiovascular disease, uh, hospitalization, so on, Bro uh, prevalence and incidence of bronchitis and asthma among adults and among children, and then uh, lost working days, and those are all numbers for, if you see, pollutant, PM, or ozone. Very little is for NOx, uh, and there is a reason why. Um, and relative risk, risk means basically by each 10% increase, uh, 10 uh, micrograms increase, you will get additional, so 1.062 in the first line basically means 6.2% um, of increase in um, uh, in all cause mortality age 30 plus I think so just for you to, so you can interpret this kind of uh, data and then maybe even use it in your calculations uh, this is something from WHO saying that um, around third of all lung cancer or stroke on heart disease are basically attributed to um, air pollution. For lung cancer, probably the rest of uh, two-thirds are for smoking, for stroke or some other um, risk factors and so on. And um, this graph goes together with um, with the why are we speaking about PM mostly in uh, NO3 or ozone? Because there are a lot of publications around uh, PM. So it's more easy to, uh, to segregate PM and uh, do analysis on that. And, um, while for NOx, uh, much less is done, uh, basic, mainly because it's a kind of scientist um, found out that it needs to be adjusted for PM and uh, because it's quite difficult to measure, blah. Uh, they are less uh, prone to do the, the scientific measurements around this in terms of health. But this does not mean that um, we should not take it seriously. So we should not measure NOx or uh, we should not think how this affects health.
basically right absence of evidence is not evidence of absence so as time progresses we develop the methods for including uh, measurements of nox on our health the data will probably um, grow bigger of course and the knowledge so this is uh, one thing that the uh, committee on medical uh, effects of air pollution from UK did, and uh, this is, I think, mo the biggest report on NO2 uh, and health, um, and how much it affects um, our health. So basically, like 23% of, um, of one policy reduction of all traffic pollutants would, would have um, influence on, uh, on all-cause mortality, I think and so on. Um, and one last thing is um, why are dif different numbers for premature deaths according to different sources? So basically the, the answer is in the methods that they are using for, for example, global burden of, of disease uh, uses different kind of concentrations and creed and, uh, on which they are looking the concentrations. Um, they are using different kind of pollution, so not just outdoor air pollution, but also indoor air pollution. Uh, and they are coding their um, health outcomes differently. So for, uh, for EEA or European Environment, mental ill agency, they are not coding it, so they are just taking all of the causes together, while global burden of disease takes only four. Uh, uh, strokes, ischemic heart dis uh, uh, disease, COPD, some lung cancer, and so on. So, um, this basically means that you should not compare the number of deaths from different sources, rather look at it as a um, relative number in, in, um, in, in this pile of numbers and not separate, uh, comparing the numbers. And to finally um, conclude um, that people in Europe are breathing a little bit cleaner air than five years ago, so there is things that we can do and that we should do um, to improve our health. Thank you. Any questions for Blanca? Uh, generally speaking, it's unusual for Europe to lag behind regulatory wise. Is there a simple explanation in this case? Is it the lobbying power of the motor vehicle industry or? <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, no, I think it's uh, back then when Europe developed the um, directive, which was 2002, if I, I'm not mistaken. Um, there was just not so much evidence that they would, and there were not so much evidence in Europe so this is one of the problems where, for example, database that exists in the US, it's so huge through Medicare, uh, and they are much better in, in just analyzing um, like strokes together than they pair it with the data from the m measurement stations, right? And then see how, like, if uh, it correlates to the hospital admissions and so on. And I think in, Nowadays, in Europe, we have a big pool of data, so I think now when air quality directive revision starts this year, that it will be, um, uh, there will be a big uh, scientific community that will then want to influence these limit, uh, limit values. But I think there is also a uh, work to do from the citizens. They need to be also aware of uh, their role to demand the lower limit values. On that note as well, most of the countries in Europe are even struggling with reaching the EU level limit values now. So I think 12 countries are being 
steps are taken by commission to put them on court <laughs> for breaching the limits. So uh, I don't know, there will be a big opposition, I think, from the um, member states as well. So. <laughs> Thank you.